Gemini Cassidy and the Fair, what we're going to be talking about, this is the fourth sermon in a series of seven, is the steps to freedom in Christ. And this particular sermon has to do with rebellion versus submission. Okay. Rebellion versus submission. Oh, My focus statement of the day is that rebellion is as witchcraft okay. and insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry. That's a serious, serious application. Amen? My function statement is obedience is better than sacrifice. Makes sense, right? These are, these are all scriptures that come out of the Word of God. And that's why it's important for you to understand how they work. Now, why is rebellion like witchcraft and insubordination like iniquity and idolatry? That's one of the first things that we ask, isn't it? Yeah. Insubordination. You know, uh, rebellion, like witchcraft. See, when we think about witchcraft, we think about some old hag out there with, with some with a magic wand throwing a potion on you or something, right? So that isn't what it is. We need to understand what the, what the, what witchcraft actually is. The practice of witchcraft is actually rebellion against anything that God has to say. Is why? God says it. Rebellion, I mean, I'm not a witch that is punishable by death, but it is an abomination. How can we recognize it when it raises its ugly head? Well, first of all, we need to understand that there are different kinds of rebellion. We can rebel against civil government. We can rebel against our employers, our parents, when we were small, our wives, my wife. I need to give her the eye. <laughs> can re who can rebel against their husband? <laughs> some of my brothers, some of my brothers and sisters are in here going like this. They know what's up. We can rebel against uh, church leaders. And sometimes we even rebel against God himself. Amen? Amen. Did you know that we have two biblical responsibilities regarding authority figures? First one is to pray for them, and the other one is to submit to them. That's according to Scripture. The only time that God permits us to disobey our earthly leaders is when they require us to do something that is morally wrong, or when they attempt to rule outside the realm of their authority. So that's one of the reasons why, ladies and gentlemen, when we, we, uh, we all live in this nation, don't we? We live in this city. But when they, just because they say that something is legal, that does not mean that it's biblical. And you have to be careful. You have to be careful. Because I've had people come up and tell me, oh, Pastor, you know, I, uh, I smoke medical marijuana. <laughs> and, I, and I'm looking at them like, well, did you bring enough for everybody? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but I don't think. Thank you very much. I said, that's no excuse. That's just something because see what happened. The law said that you can do it. That don't mean that you're supposed to do it. So what that's doing is that, that puts us in, a, in an area of what the Bible calls pharmacia. And that has to do with witchcraft also. So you got to be careful about that. Don't let yourself get involved in that. So when this rebellion, when, when this rebellion begins to infiltrate the church, what does it look like? Well, let me hit you guys to something. Yeah. Come on. Let me hit you to something. That's going on in churches all over the country right now. Did you know that there are a number of converted witches? They're traveling around the country, warning congregations that there is a plot that is hatched amongst evil witches and Satanists to enter congregations posing as super spiritual Christians. They're doing this in a lot of churches, but are mainly posing this and targeting charismatic churches. Now, do you know what a charismatic church is? Some of you may not know what that is. I used to go to one a long time ago. Charismatic churches, they're, 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 like we believe in the movement of the Holy Spirit. No problem. We know that the Holy Spirit does many miracles. All kinds of them. We know that 
let the Holy Spirit is involved speaking in tongues and so forth. But these are, these are these witches, they come in and they give themselves a bump and they pose as spiritually supernatural Christians. Because what they're doing is introducing a lot of spells and chanting and all kinds of stuff like that in the church. And you've got to be careful of what it is that they're actually asking you to do. They're doing this in a lot of churches because they're, they're mainly targeting them. They're targeting these, especially these charismatic churches. But that's not the only thing. They have them right here. We had one come in here Thursday night. People don't even understand. You don't realize it. They come in here and they try to get you to go along with what it is that they're doing. Now, why are they targeting charismatic churches? Because they're famous for their belief in the movement of the Holy Spirit. They believe extensively in the working of miracles. And that's where these witches and Satanists can cloak themselves in the disguise of super spiritual Christians. We had one that came in Thursday night. I'm teaching the Bible study. She looked at me and she started trying to, what do they call it, the fortune stuff. Over, over me. Yeah, the unfortunate. Tell, tell me about my sisters. And, this, and I said, hold up, hold up. I said, first of all, you don't even know my sisters. And, and, and I told her, I said, everything that you're saying is not even correct. I said, you need to understand, this is a Christian church. And we only teach Bible here, amen? And that was all there was to that. So we need to understand, you've got to be aware. These things are out there, and they're coming for you. So the question is, why do they want to infiltrate the church in this way anyway? Well, what is the enemy's main function? He comes to deceive, right? He, he comes to deceive. He comes to shipwreck pastors and lead, na lead naive people into a cult practice. Did you know that there are many churches today that practice chanting? They don't even know what they're chanting about. They do it under the leadership of a pastor or a teacher that claims that it's another way to achieve the peace that surpasses all understanding. I remember there was a lady back when I was in high school. Never will forget her. Uh, she was the homecoming queen. I used to go to her house and have a coffee and we said, oh, this is before I even knew who Christ was. She tried to introduce me to her religion. And I said, well, what's that all about? She says, well, all you got to do is, is just start chanting this particular thing, and, and God will give you what you want. And I said, well, what is the thing I got to chant? Yeah. Well, I'm going to try to remember it. It was something like, Rama Lama, Ding Dong. <laughs> she came up with some kind of whole thing. I'm supposed to be, you know, the Sandra, the land of Right. And, and I was supposed to keep on saying this and so that God this whatever this thing was, was going to come in and give me. But you know something, even though I didn't know Jesus, God gave me some discernment that said that something demonic is going here, is going on here. Amen? Right. Just something told me not to even get myself mixed up in there. Right. So we need to understand there is no other way to that, uh, that we are to achieve the peace that God has passed all understanding, except by the way that the word of God says so. So can you see how the enemy mixes truth with deception? Now, Philippians 4, 6 and 7 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known, you may know to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your heart and minds in Christ's peace. That's the way that we go for peace. That's the way that we go for the peace that surpasses all understanding. Amen? We need to stop being naive. Don't just follow somebody just because they come off and tell you, this is cool. Or oh, this is the way that we do it. A lot of people say, well, this is the shortcut. We can do it this way and you'll get to it much quicker. Let me tell you something. That's exactly what Jesus does. I mean, what Satan tried to do to Jesus when he took him up on the mountain. He said, look, you know what? Gotta go to the cross. Just bow down and worship me a little bit and I'll give it all to you. You don't have to suffer. You don't have to go through the pain or nothing. What did Jesus tell him? Don't say you must worship the Lord of God. Nobody else. Him alone. 
And that's exactly what we do. We need to understand, do you want to know what truth is? Where do you get it? You get it out of the Word of God. No place else. The Bible tells us to be wise as serpents, but innocent as no. We need to be vigilant and aware of what's going on around us at all times. Now, what are the most popular rebellion and insubordination practices in the church today? Keep this all in mind, because you may not even realize what you're doing. It is a rebellion against the very word of God. And why do you think that is? It's because we often think that we know a better way. We often think that we are allowed to get it like that way. So I think I need to do it this way. Or some other alternative way to accomplish what we're trying to do. We often don't want to follow the traditional way to grow. We start looking for shortcuts. Or we get off track and we follow other people's suggestions. Ladies and gentlemen, let me explain something to you. There are no shortcuts. Let me just make it clear to you. You know, I used to sit there and I would pray to God and I'd say, Lord, why don't you just go and turn me into this super mature Christian. Why do I got to go through all this other stuff? And you know what? The Lord spoke to me in my spirit and I heard him say, he said, he said, Tony, if, you, if I did that, you'd be no good. And I'm like, what do you mean I'd be no good to you? And also I got these pictures in my head that if he was to go point and turn me into this super spiritual Christian, I'd be walking around here with y'all just like this. So you have a problem, huh? Well, why do you have a problem? You're over here me. See what I, I got going on? <laughs> That's why I'd be no good. Let me explain something to you, ladies and gentlemen. It doesn't matter what I do here. I'm the pastor, yeah, I'm the pastor. But I'm the pastor. You know why? Because, man, I've been through it. God has put me through it, and I'll tell you what, if there's nothing else that I understand, I am not here to judge anybody. Amen? I'm here to help you. I'm here to help you because we're all going through it. Amen? Yeah. That's what I'm here for. If I, listen, if I see you making a really, really bad mistake, okay, I'm going to tell you, come on to my office. Let's go. Let's go. Let's sit down. And when I get you in, I'm going to explain to you what I'm seeing and ask him what the problem is. Let's see if I can help you fix it and, and give you some good advice on how we can get rid of this problem. You know, to, to try to help you. Not for any other reason. I mean, I'm not, I'm not here to try to dog anybody out. But I just want you to understand. I'm going to have to answer for you one day. The Bible says that I'm going to be standing before Jesus. And now I've got to make an account for you. Because he's given me this responsibility. What does that mean? Well, that means if you're smoking all that miracle marijuana, then I didn't say something to you. When I'm standing there, Jesus is going to say to me, Tony, why did, you, why did you let them think that it was okay? And you want to know something? <laughs> let me tell you how the Holy Spirit works. He had, there's some reason he's got me telling you all this right now. There's somebody out there right now that's smoking medical marijuana and you think it's okay. Come on, Pat. You think it's all right. But you know what the Holy Spirit is that? You know, it's not. It's not okay. You need to get off that. Man. If you're smoking medical marijuana, what are you smoking or something? I got black coma. And I don't want to hear that. Don't let you Because they got pills and stuff like that. If you can take it, help you out with the dry home, you can smoke it up with weed. Not only that, but you know something? Our brothers can't do anything about it. You know, you said they're talking about this man, medical marijuana. Just because I sprinkled some hair on and some crystal meth in there, you know, some cocaine, talking about a primo. That's what they do, don't they? That's exactly what they do. Getting all way down. <laughs> that's what happens to it. Come on, Listen, y'all got a pastor here that's been around the block, okay? Amen. I know the deal. Amen. I know the deal. 
He sent his slaves to the vine growers to receive his brother. The vine growers took the slaves, they beat one, killed another, and stoned the third. And again, he sent another group of slaves larger than the first. And they did the same thing to them. But afterward, he sent his son to the same. Well, they will respect my son. But when the vine growers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill and seize his inheritance. They took him and they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? They said to him, well, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end. They will rent out the vine, the vineyard, to another vine, to another vine grower, who will pay him the proceeds at the proper season. Jesus said to them, did you never read in the scripture the stone which, is, which the builders rejected? This became the chief cornerstone? This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to the people producing fruit of it. And he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on whoever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they understood that he was speaking about them. Now, we need to understand what did happen here. There's a couple of things that we're going to go over. First of all, the harvest time has come. Now, we, we look at things like the harvest time in the vineyard was the time when they were going to gather grapes. They were going to grab the grapes, and they were going to bring what the produce was supposed to do to the king, to the, to the landowner. But they didn't do that, did they? They wanted to keep it all for themselves. They were disobedient. And what is it? Disobedience is like witchcraft because they rebelled against her. They rebelled against her. And the landowner had given them all kinds of stuff. He said, look, all you have to do is just give me my share. Give me my issue. That's all you wanted. But they didn't do that. They were going to keep it all. So what did he do? He sent his slaves to collect this produce. But they beat one, killed another, and stoned the third. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. Each and every one of us, our job is to spread the word of God. To bring as many people to Christ as we possibly can. Amen. That's what's supposed to happen. Each one of us is supposed to do that. But the problem is that sometimes we just don't do it. We're disobedient. We don't talk about it. We don't do anything. We just keep on living our lives. Let me tell you something. The Bible says that in the end times, that's what's going to happen. When the end comes, well, they're going to be doing what we've been doing. Kicking it. Drinking to the levels. Drinking bottles of Cisco. All this kind of stuff. We're just going to be cruising. And when the end comes, it's going to catch us like that. We need to understand what's going on here. There are people, those of us who are out there, who are trying to do what God told us to do. And a lot of people, they're going to just reject what it is we have to say. That's okay. Your job is, is to spread the word. And let me tell you something. If somebody comes to Christ because of you, good, that's a good thing. But let me tell you something. The pure fact that you spread the word doesn't go unnoticed. God notices what you're doing. He notices that you're trying to follow him. And of it is the sound in heaven that will become very, very familiar to you. When you preach the word to somebody, even if they listen or don't, if you listen closely, you'll hear a sound that goes chiching. It goes into your account. It builds up your account in heaven. Amen? Yeah. That's one of the things. Now, also, when they uh, when they killed when they killed those uh, the, the servants and stone the third and so forth, he said, "Oh, I did group of slaves," and they did the same to them. What does that mean? That means that even though. Sometimes we preach the word, we help, we try to help people come to Christ. People don't listen, they reject us. And you may not ever run across that person again, but let me tell you something. God always sent somebody else. When he was coming after me, I was too busy chasing the bag. You couldn't get a hold of me. And I had people jump out of the church. I got a word for you from God. And I said, well, you've got to catch me while I'm running because i got to be really high. <laughs> 
I'm running, trying to go do what I was doing. But you know what that means? God knew that he was going to bring me to me. And even though I didn't respond to the first thing that he brought that he sent and had that down in my way, there finally came a time when I listened to somebody. So God, if he's got, a, if he's got an eye on you, he's going to keep bringing you into your path. Somebody that's going to listen, that, 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 that you might listen to. Amen? Amen. Now, the third thing is that he said the son, saying that they will assuredly respect my son. But when they saw him, they said, this is the heir. Let us kill him and seize his inheritance. Ladies and gentlemen, every time that we refuse, or when somebody refuses to hear what you have to say about Jesus, they're really, really taking their lives in their own hands. Because what does God say? It says in the Bible that if they don't listen to you, they haven't listened to me. God is telling them, if they don't listen to you, if they're rejecting you, they're rejecting me. So that's another reason why I don't want you to ever feel bad or, or feel like somebody has done you so wrong. Because let me tell you something, if they're going to do it to Jesus, they're going to do it to you too. Amen? Amen. They rejected Jesus, they're going to reject it. And then number five says, they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and he killed him. People that reject Jesus Christ, if they could, we sit there and we say to ourselves, I would never do that. I would have recognized who Jesus was. Everything would have been fine with me and Jesus then. No, no, no. Let me explain something to you. If they did it, if you're going to reject Jesus now, you'll do it here. I'll tell you why it happens, too. We reject Jesus, and what happens? Immediately, the Holy Spirit brings in conviction. If you're one of those people that you've been raised around the Bible, Mama used to tell you about the Bible, you know about Jesus, you know about God, but you ain't really following what you should. And all of a sudden, somebody steps up and says, Jesus loves you. you know, he wants you to come to church. He wants you to learn what his word is all about. But you don't want to know, so you feel this little sting. It's like the Holy Spirit is letting you know what he's telling you is correct. And you don't want to come, let me give you a little one of these. And it just gets your attention. It's called conviction. He's trying to let you know something that you need to listen to what this guy's telling you. Come and get involved. Start to nurture a relationship with me. That's what he's trying to tell you. Number six says, Jesus asked the question in verse 40. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? Ladies and gentlemen, we need to understand something. If we don't respond to Jesus the way that we're supposed to, if we don't get control, if we don't get control over our, our, our human or our, our, our fleshly desire, we're going to have to answer to God. We're going to have to answer to Him. And like I said earlier, you may not, you know, I mean, you may believe that everything is cool with you. But every time somebody starts talking about going to heaven, you're wondering to yourself, am I, am I going to go? Because something's going on. Something's going on. Not with you, so I'm <laughs> Something might be going on in your life and you need to get it straightened out. Holy Spirit, let me know. It's funny. Amen? Amen? So let me pick it up in verse 41. See what the answer was when they asked him. He said, 41 said, And they said to him, He will bring those wretches to a wretched end and will rent out the vineyard to other vine growers who will pay him the proceeds at the proper season. Do you understand what that means? If we don't do what it is that we're supposed to do, if we are supposed to be his servants, if we don't do what it is that we're supposed to do, he's going to bring somebody else to do it. Somebody else is going to do it. And we're just going to get that down. We're going to be considered disobedient. So, as we read this parable, we need to understand that it is more than just a retelling of how the Jews rejected God's provision for salvation through his son Jesus Christ and how the Jews would be cast aside and the husbandry would be given to the Gentiles. But this parable is also about a great supernatural battle over the inheritance that God has got to us. It's about a battle between Satan and Jesus Christ over the souls and allegiances of mankind. 
It's about who is going to rule over the hearts and the minds of God's chosen people. So church, you are either under the influence of God or you are under the influence of Satan. There is no in-between. It's important to understand that. I can tell you how many people I've had to talk about Jesus. They said, well, I don't, I don't want to follow Jesus right now, but I don't want to follow Satan. So I'm just going to just be where I'm at. <laughs> don't you understand? If you don't follow Jesus, you are with Satan. Because there's only two spots. There's not three spots. Jesus sends Satan. No, it don't work that way. If you're not with Jesus, you're with Satan. And if you're under the influence of Satan, you are in complete and active rebellion against God. You see, this parable is about a people of God who became bewitched by Satan and ended up totally possessed by the spirit of the Antichrist. In parable, Christ was talking about a most unassuming and powerful form of witchcraft. The rebellion against the truth of God's word. Now, the key to the parable is where Jesus describes the vine growers and saying, this is the heir, come let us kill him and let us seize the inheritance. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Satan speaking. And what he is really saying is let us create rebellion against the Son and let us crucify him. We'll take control. Ladies and gentlemen, that's exactly where all of us, where life is, where this planet is. When you think about it, a lot of the people that don't want to go to church, they don't want to follow Christ. What are they actually saying? What they're actually saying is that, you know what? We don't want to do what you say. We just want to follow ourselves. That's the reason why this nation is so guilty of kicking God out of the school. It's so guilty kicking God out of the public square. It's so guilty kicking God out of the justice system and out of our courts. They don't even want the Ten Commandments on the wall. Kicking God out. And why is that? Because they want to do it themselves. They want to make their own rules. They want to make their own regulations. They want to follow their own way. We need to understand. They want to take control. They want to take it away from God. Now, although it's true, true that Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees, he's also speaking to the church today. How is that? When we read in Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, which says, For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God, and the powers of the age to come. And then they're fallen away. It is impossible to renew them again to repent, since they again crucified to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, a lot of people think that all that's talking about is us falling back into sin. But a lot of us that have studied the word of God, when we look at the word of God in whole, what we understand is that there are people that have finally put their faith in Christ. And now what it is, they believe. They believe in grace and mercy. But there are people that are out there that think that you have to be the best person that you have to be. That you are living your life. You need to be good in order to get to heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, that doesn't get you into heaven. There's a lot of good people out there that don't do any bad things. That don't believe in Jesus Christ at all. And let me tell you something. They are not going to heaven because they seem to be good people. That does it good. So when we taste it, what it is that God has given, when we taste the goodness of God, when we taste His mercy and His grace, and the pure fact that what gets us into heaven is Christ in us, because His righteousness is given to us, that's what we understand. And if we stop believing in that, and we go back to thinking that we we got to do this because we, we got to be good. That's the only way we're going to get in. And they start putting that on everybody else. Listen, I want you guys to understand something. Very important. When pastor encourages you to be as good as you possibly can, it's not so that you go to heaven. It's so that you get a great reward when you get there. Do you understand that? Only one thing gets you to heaven. Christ is in you. You must be born again. That's the key that unlocks the early gates of but you need to live your life correctly now so that when you get there, you've got rewards. 
got, you got a good life. You got something to say. Listen, did you do it right in this world? I didn't either. If we did it right in this world, you'd be a doctor, I'd be an attorney. Be that guy was down Manhattan Beach, doing what it is we're doing. We would, we would be living a great life. We'd have a, we, we, if we would have done it right in this world. But we didn't. But we got a second chance, don't we? Got a second chance. So they were openly in rebellion to God's word. And as a result, they crucified the Son of God all over again, putting him to open shame. That's when we have tasted what it is that we're supposed to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, but yet we believe that we have to work our way in. So, who is that that is crucifying Christ over and over again? Who is it? It's not riches. It's not Satan. It's not homosexuals or murderers. No, it's none of these. There are those who heard and tasted and partook of the true word of God and then allowed the spirit of rebellion to take root. You've got to keep your eye on the prize. You've got to keep your eyes on the prize. Church, let me tell you something. I don't believe that a person can come to true repentance as long as they are in rebellion against God. In other words, how are you going to repent when you are obviously practicing sin and living your life against God's command? In other words, if you're living your life in sin, if there's something that you're doing that you ain't got no business doing, how are you going to come to repentance? You can't come to repentance. You're living your life in sin. So you need to take care of that business. It's called rebellion. And it is as the sin of witchcraft. So, rebellion against civil government is like the sin of witchcraft. Romans 13, 1 through 2 says, Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authority. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. That means that we need to obey them. Now, there are things that are going on where civil government has got some problems, isn't it? We've been watching it on the news. We've got all kinds of issues. Okay? But I'm going to tell you something. When we live by God's rule, when we live by God, He's the one that takes care of us. He's the one that watches over us. If they're trying to make you or force you to do something that is immoral, or whatever is trying to make you obey a, uh, obey a law that is openly against the word of God, then you have the right to stand up and say, no, we're not going to go there. But other than that, you need to be obedient. Also, rebellion against the employer is as the sin of witchcraft. First Peter 2, 18 to 19 says, Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. For this finds favor, if for the sake of conscience, for God a person bears up unto sorrow when suffering and unjust. You know, my wife has to go through that. My wife has to She works a job, but they talk to her so disrespectfully sometimes. And I'll tell you something, I'll be real honest with you. They would have done this 25, 30 years ago when I was with her. I'd have dressed all in black. <laughs> And I'd have been down there waiting for when the doors were closed. Yes, sir. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I'd have had on a mask. All that stuff, and I'd have come out there thinking I was baby proof. But I wouldn't let nobody hurt my baby like that. But you know what? I have to put up with that. And my wife comes home sometimes when she's in tears. And I hold her so she feels better. And, and, and we, we deal with it together. But you know what? She puts up with it. She does what she's supposed to do. And the best person that she can possibly be. And the Bible says that the Lord finds favor in her for putting up with that. Amen? Amen. So we need to remember that as we go through. Number two, also, number three, rebellion against church leaders is as a sin of witchcraft. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your soul as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to understand. I know I'm not out there looking to, to you know, treat somebody better or to say something to them or, or, or to hurt their feelings. I'm not out there for that. I'm not even out here looking for anybody that's getting high. 
I ain't looking for that. If you're getting high and you come and you do something in front of me that, that makes me look at you a little strange, I'm going to say something to you. Amen. You can't come up to me. Hey, Pastor, how you doing today? <laughs> something not tell on me. My wife will tell you. I get high and come home, she goes, oh, no. She knows exactly what I just do. Ain't no doubt about it. Now, I've been trying to hide it, too. Just got out of the shower, trying not. She's going to be home in a minute. I need to keep myself. I got to do something to make sure she can't tell. She comes in, hi, honey, I'm home. Somehow, don't we? we need to keep in mind those of us who have been put in this position. Listen, you need to understand. I didn't get to go into any of this. I was appointed. Amen. And when I was appointed, I was appointed by a general superintendent who Jesus told him what to do. Because he knew that I would love him, that I would care for him, and I would be there for him. He knew and he wanted somebody to be here. I was going to pass to this church to love you, to be here for you, how to help you through all the stuff that you're doing. So, it says here that do it, do it in such a way to let them do this with joy and not with grief. And I'll tell you something, we've got some brothers and sisters that sometimes come through the church, we love to bring a brother grief. You know what I mean? Love to bring a brother grief. But I'm going to tell you something, with all honesty. Jesus, this is his church. And when people don't, when they want to give you a lot of grief, they don't want to obey, they don't want to do it with, with the, the, the Holy Spirit has moved them on their way. They're not even here. Some of them are not even alive yet. Amen. There are things that they did, or whatever the case may be, I believe the Lord took them on out, took them home. So we need to understand. Watch out for that, okay? And just understand that those of us who have been placed in leadership, what here to help them? We're not here to preach. Amen? Also, the last one I want to talk about, rebellion against God is as the son of which Daniel 9, 5, 9 says that we have sinned. This is Daniel praying. He says, we have sinned, committed iniquity, acted wickedly, and rebelled, even turning aside from your commandments and orders. And then verse 9 says, to the Lord our God belong compassion and forgiveness. For we have rebelled against him. Ladies and gentlemen, when we violate God's commandments, when we don't listen to what he tells us to do, we are in rebellion. And rebellion is as witchcraft. We need to understand what it is that we're doing. When you disobey God's commandments on purpose, and you do it intentionally, it's rebellion. It's as witchcraft. And we don't want to be that way. Because I'm going to tell you something, when the time comes and you're standing before the Lord, and he brings this stuff up, you ain't going to be able to say, Lord, I didn't do no witchcraft. I, I didn't. No, he's going to tell you, well, you were rebellion. You, you, were, you were sinning against me intentionally. I'll tell you something. What does that mean? If you're going to, you're going to sin, you fall into a sin place. You get stuck. Pray to God. Pray to him every day. That's just that. That's what you do. Get it off your back. Pray that he will give you the strength to stop that, whatever it is that you've been doing. Amen? Amen? So ladies and gentlemen, we need to be very careful. Looking to ourselves and making sure that we don't fall into a spirit of the Antichrist. A spirit of rebellion and insubordination. We need to remember that all authority is ordained by God. And that we don't have the right as Christians to sit in judgment over those who have been placed in authority over us. That would be government 
authorities, that would be employers, that would be church leaders, and let's not forget, parents and husbands. So the next time that we consider standing up in rebellion, let's remember that being under authority is, as an, act of, is an act of faith. When it seems hard to do it, remember that we are trusting God to work through His established lines of authority, which means that when we find ourselves being uh, violated by the powers that be, God has placed them under the authority as well. Always remember that even though we might let them off the hook, they are never off of God's hook. Amen? Amen. 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 My name is Anthony Stallworth, and I'm a senior pastor at Central City Community Church of the Nazarene. We're located at 419 East 6th Street, downtown Los Angeles, on the corner of 6th and San Pedro. We are a church that serves the Skid Row community, so I'm sure that you can imagine that it's difficult for us to support our ministry with the tithes and the offerings. If today's message has helped you, perhaps you would like to come alongside Central City and prayerfully consider helping support this ministry by sending your tax-deductible gift to Central City Community Church, P.O. Box 13273, Los Angeles, California, 90013.